he was arrested in Jerusalem after being warned not to go there. Um, and Paul, I, I don't want to say defiantly, but almost defiantly, um, said, I don't really care. Uh, I'm willing to die for Christ. And I want to read that passage because it, um, I think, is really powerful. Uh, but I think if, if you could sum up one word for today's lesson on Paul's journey to, to Rome, uh, it's conviction. And, and you have to give Paul 100% credit for the conviction that he had, that he was willing to die for the name of Christ. And I, I, I just saw a video, um, I think it was yesterday, um, it was either yesterday or Friday, I'm pretty sure it was yesterday, but um, Penn, DP, it's your birthday, and you feel like you can do whatever you want. <laughs> He's back there partying in the sound booth. Happy birthday, by the way, DP. Um, but I, I, I was watching a video in, in Penn from Penn and Teller, um, the famous magicians. Penn is a, a, a professed atheist. And he was talking about Christians, and he said, you know, I actually, I actually don't have respect for Christians who aren't proselytizing uh, atheists. And he's like, if, they genuinely, if Christians genuinely believe that people are going to go to hell, if, if they believe that, uh, you know, there's life after death, and that there's, there's a, a penalty for not being Christians, he said, I don't have any respect for Christians that don't proselytize and try to teach us atheists. And I thought that that's kind of an interesting perspective that you don't hear. Usually you hear the opposite, that uh, unbelievers don't want Christians talking about their faith. Um, you know, they don't want to hear it. They, they don't have respect for Christians that proselytize. And Penn said just the opposite. And I thought that's really interesting because you have to remember there are atheists out there um, who wildly respect Christians uh, and who will come to Christ if we try to teach them. Uh, and, and Paul unapologetically proselytized and uh, taught people the gospel. And, and as long as he had an audience, it didn't matter if he was in jail, it didn't matter if he was um, defending himself in front of governors, it didn't matter. Paul used that as an opportunity to preach, and he did that every single where he went. So I think that's really cool. We're going to be in the book of Acts. And we're going to back up. Uh, nah. I mean, if you want to, you can, but we don't need it up there. Um, okay. Uh, chapter 20 of Acts. And this is when Paul, uh, he's kind of making his way back to Jerusalem. And uh, you have the talk that Paul has to the Ephesian elders um, on the beach at Miletus, uh, that really impassioned speech. Uh, you also have Eutychus raised from the dead uh, whenever they went to Troas. Uh, so they went from Troas uh, down to Miletus, where Paul meets with the Ephesian elders, and he says... Um, I don't think that we'll ever see each other again. And, of course, that grieved the elders, and they began to cry. Uh, it's, it's one of the most impassioned speeches. Um, uh, verse 36 of chapter 20, uh, chapter 20, And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on, on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful, sorrowful most of all because the word he had spoken, that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. Um, this is one of those emotional things that you have to realize in ministry, um, relationships come and go constantly. And we get so used to being in the same place, at the same congregation, with the same people. Uh, Paul was constantly meeting people and leaving people. And, and the same was true in his life. Uh, people came and went constantly, and there's, there's a big emotional punch uh, whenever that happens. Uh, verse, or chapter 21. Um, uh, let's start in... Um, 
start in verse, well, let's just start in verse 1. And when we had parted from, from them and set sail, we came by a straight course to Kos, and the next day to Rhodes, and from there to uh, Patara. And having found a ship crossing to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had come, uh, when we had come in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unload its cargo. And having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days. And through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. Um, this is kind of an inter interesting phrase here because it was the Spirit himself telling Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Uh, we, know, we know the end of the story. Did Paul go to Jerusalem? Absolutely. Uh, so what's interesting is the Spirit, though the Spirit was telling Paul not to go to Jerusalem, God still works with us um, through our own stubborn headedness. Uh, Paul was very stubborn. Like, Paul had it made up in his mind. He was going to Jerusalem no matter the outcome. Um, and God still used that uh, for his good. Verse 5, when our days there were ended, we departed and went on our journey. And they all, with wives and children, accompanied us until we were outside the city. And kneeling down on the beach, we prayed and said farewell to one another. And then we went, uh, we went on to board the ship, and they returned home. Uh, verse 7, and when we had finished a voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemy, Ptolemy, Ptolemais, and we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for one day. On the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea, and we entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. Uh, while we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea, and coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, let the will of the Lord be done. Um, that passage gives me chills because Paul's conviction is so strong that he's actually annoyed that people are crying over him. Um, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? Um, Paul viewed that as, as a hindrance to the gospel. Um, I talk about this constantly here. Um, I guess one other word, if you could sum up both Jesus' ministry and, and Paul's, if, if you could pick one word, I would, I would describe it as mission. They had a mission. They had a mission marked out before them. They knew exactly what they were here on this planet Earth to do, and they were laser-focused on that mission, and nothing, even death, would stop them from, from that mission. Um, One thing that we covered last week, going back to what you talked about with the Spirit, I asked the question, was the Spirit giving conflicting information? Because it said, it was tell, like they, the way they were telling him, don't go to Jerusalem. Was the Spirit actually telling them not to go to Jerusalem? Or was the Spirit saying, this is what's going to happen when you go to Jerusalem? Because it also, because also Jesus comes yeah. and says, you're going to testify in Rome as you have in Jerusalem. So yeah. my take on it was that it's not contradictory, it's just their interpretation of the way yeah. that the Spirit was talking and, or what it was saying to them versus what Paul was saying is, no, I'm going yeah. because I've been told I'm going, but I know what awaits me. That, that's an interesting point, because, and I agree with you. Um, and you can see there's flexibility in uh, interpretation, too, because uh, like the Macedonian call, we talked about that, where they actually collaborated and were like, all right, well, what's the meaning of this vision? Um, and they came to the conclusion that they were being called into Macedonia. Whether they were or not, we, I mean, we honestly don't know because the scriptures don't tell us. Uh, but I think you're right. I, I, I think it's very possible that some of them interpreted that as the Spirit saying, don't go to Jerusalem. Paul's saying, all I know is I, I'm getting this vision that I have to go to Jerusalem and that I'm going to wind up in Rome. 
and God is, God is going to lead me there. Uh, Paul didn't know, at least I don't think, Paul didn't know how that was going to unfold. I don't think Paul knew that he was going to be arrested, uh, that he was going to appeal, because Paul, Paul wouldn't have gone through all of these defenses if, if, if he knew what the route was to get to Rome, because all he had to do is say, hey, I'm not even going to go through these trials. Um, I appeal to Caesar. He would have just appealed in the first place, but Paul didn't do that. Paul went through all these various trials, and then finally, as a last resort, he appealed to Caesar. That's what got him to Rome. Um, so I don't think Paul knew at all what the chain of events would be. He knew that he was going to get arrested when he went to Jerusalem. Yeah. But he didn't know anything beyond that. Yeah, or, right. I assume he didn't know anything beyond that. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't think he did. I, I would make the assumption he didn't know because it wouldn't be like Paul to waste his, <clears throat> his time going through all of these defenses. And they're pretty lengthy defenses, too. Uh, I think Paul, and Paul had every right as a Roman citizen, he could have immediately just appealed to Caesar and, and, and they would have had to do it um, because he's a Roman citizen. So, you know, I, I, think, I think you're right. I think Paul, Paul knew kind of what the outcome was going to be. He knew that trouble waited for him. Um, and so this wasn't really a surprise. I think Paul wasn't shocked when Agabus was, was telling him, hey, whoever owns this, this is what's going to happen to you. I, I think Paul, Paul knew that. Um, but his conviction, I think, is so powerful, and it's marked out by his mission. Paul's mission is to preach the gospel, and he says it all the time. Whether I'm in chains or whether I'm free, it doesn't matter. Um, I'm going to preach the gospel of Christ. And I think we, <clears throat> we as Americans especially, really don't grasp this in practice. Uh, maybe intellectually we do. Um, but in practice, we're, we're shut down so easily. And it goes back to what Penn said, where Penn's like, I don't, I don't respect Christians who don't proselytize, who aren't so convicted about their faith that they're going to do everything in their power to convince me that there is a God. Um, I don't respect people who, who shy away from that. They claim they follow this God, but they don't tell me about it. Like, I, I don't respect those people. What were you going to say, Tex? Yeah, to me, it, it's almost as if today, in, in, in today's day, time, you know, uh, people are just so argumentative. Yeah. They can't have a discussion without arguing about, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I mean, I see a lot of Christians doing this too, where they, they get caught up in these petty arguments that are non-salvation arguments whatsoever, and they, they end up, in my opinion, just looking like buffoons because they're, they're fighting over the most ridiculous arguments. And it, I mean, I'll give you an, ex <clears throat> excuse me, an example. And I mean, if you're convicted, whatever. I, I mean, that, if you're convicted one way or the other, great, fine. I think that's a Romans 14 issue where Paul says, if you have opinions about these things, as long as you're doing something or not doing something for the Lord, let it go. Uh, move on. Uh, but the example is um, the American flag displayed on the stage of a church building. This, I never knew this was like a church splittable, like such a highly offensive thing on both sides of, of, of the aisle. Uh, I just never knew. I, I guess I was naive, but um, I started seeing these arguments that, and some of these people were friends of mine. And they were just so loud and adamant and getting nasty. And, you know, some were like, uh, we're, not, we're not Americans, we're Christians. We belong to Christ. Okay, great. I mean, if you're convicted about that, I don't have a problem with that at all. If you're offended by the flag on the stage, uh, I don't know, I, I, I'm not going to judge you for that. Um, I, think, I think that what's important about those kind of things is realizing how it looks to everybody who's not a Christian. That's exactly right. Fighting over things that, like, now, we all have our, like you said, we have our opinion, and we should, and we should hold to that, and, and if it means that, like, maybe somebody's not comfortable coming to a church that has an American flag there or something, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, if it means that, like, that's their choice, but to be mean to each other about it. Yeah. To be 
and quitting. I knew ministers that would, they were quitting their, they were resigning over an American flag. Yeah, I mean, kind of going back to like what you were talking about, I forget if this was a week ago, well, I guess it was at least two weeks ago. Uh, yeah, wouldn't be last week. <laughs> yeah, so whatever, uh, like with the Christmas holiday and like what, what people do with that. Yeah. I think as long as we don't, like to me, on the, that, kind of, that kind of stuff, as long as we don't forget what we're supposed to be doing. Like if somebody says, yeah. well, the only time I have to go to church is Christmas because that's a special day. Or, yeah. Although one time I have to go to church is Easter because that's a special, like that's wrong. Like we right. Correct that. Sure. But if somebody says, I want to celebrate this as a special day themselves. Yeah. Like, yeah. Isn't that Great. exactly what that scripture is saying there? Right. Like, okay. But so as long as you're not taking away from what God has said. Yeah. Or you're not, or you're not teaching a false doctrine. I think we have to be careful how we talk to each other. Yeah. Like, it's, not, it's not wrong for us to have that opinion. Right. But, well, but to be, as this text said, argumentative about it and that, like mean to each other about it. That's and just creating right. lines in the sand over yeah, that. That's and, you get into yeah, it, but I, you know, I, I was, I was reading, and I just observed. I didn't join in these conversations because um, it's just it, it doesn't matter. It's, we don't have a flag. Uh, if we did have a flag, great. You know, let's worship God. We're not here to worship a flag. I think all of us realize that. Um, but, you know, there was somebody on the opposite side, and they said, well, we have, uh, we live in a transitory town with a military base, and so we have a lot of veterans. And so for them, um, it's, it's a way for us to honor them as Christians. It's a foot washing where we honor them for serving our country. Um, and so, you know, this, this person said that, and like I, I'm like, yeah, absolutely. They're not worshiping a flag. They're not. They're not saying we're national nationalist, and you know, uh, Christian. We 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 lay claims to Christianity because we're Americans. Like nobody's saying that. And so I saw both sides of this argument, and nobody could come to an impasse. And I'm like. As an unbeliever watching these kinds of interactions, it goes back to what Penn said. Like, I have no respect for people. You're not proselytizing. You're not teaching me how to be saved. Uh, you're arguing about all these different things. And so Paul, uh, quite the opposite of that, uh, he dealt with all kinds of explosive issues. Um, and he just worked through it. And Paul himself says, I became all things to all men so that I might win a few. Uh, for Christ. So, you know, uh, again, Paul's marked out by mission, and you see this, I think, especially on his way to Rome. Uh, this is really cool. So we're going to be in chapter 27. This is when he actually uh, takes off and sails for Rome. I'm going to be reading a lot, but um, we'll, we'll certainly talk about it, too, and kind of unpack it. Uh, chapter 27 of Acts, starting in verse 1. When it was decided that we should set sail for Italy, they delivered Paul and some, of the, some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. Uh, and embarking in a ship at, I'm not even going to try to pronounce that, um, it's too early in the morning, uh, which was about to set sail to the ports along the coast of Asia, we put, put it to sea, accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. The next day we put in at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him leave to go to his friends and be cared for. Uh, I want to stop there for a second. I think this is really significant. Everywhere that Paul went, uh, with probably the exception of in Philippi, when him and Silas were flogged and put in prison, everywhere Paul went, um, Paul was treated with tremendous respect. Uh, do you remember King Agrippa? Uh, King Agrippa was like, hey, wait a second, Paul. Uh, like, I like you. I respect you. But are you trying to convince me uh, to become a Christian? And Paul said, short time or long, um, as, long as, I'm, as long as I have time in front of you, um, I'm going to preach the gospel of Christ. You know, Paul, Paul, was, Paul had this respect even among kings. Uh, they, they liked him. They really liked him. Uh, I think Paul, Paul was kind. Paul was compassionate. He wasn't combative. Uh, Paul wasn't arguing about, 
you know, a Roman flag on the stage. Uh, you know, Paul treated people with tremendous respect. Uh, remember when he goes into Athens? Just a blatantly pagan city, wildly pagan city. How does Paul begin his sermon? Ladies and gentlemen of Athens, I see that in every way you are a very religious people. He commends them. He compliments them. Um, you even have a statue to an unknown God. Now about this unknown God, let me tell you who he is, who this unknown God is. Um, Paul, what was Paul's name before it was Paul? Saul. Do you know when Paul got his name? It was on his first missionary journey. Do you know? Yeah, so Paul's on his first missionary journey. He goes, um, uh, he goes, uh, he goes on the island where, where he's from. Uh, Paul's from Tarsus. Paul's on the island. He's making his way across, across the island. He meets this guy named Sergius Paulus. Um, this guy's like a governor for, for the island. And Paul really likes this guy. And Paul's teaching him about Christ. And, you know, it's like this mutual respect. From that point on, there's not really any reason given. Saul is now Paul. And so most, uh, most scholars believe that Paul took on Sergius Paulus's name because Paul had such deep respect for him. Um, so it's pretty cool. Like everywhere Paul goes, Paul's gaining respect. And look at the way that a lot of Christians talk to people and they're like even each other and they just kind of trash people and talk bad about them. And well, no wonder they're acting the way they are. They don't know Jesus. I'm like, no, 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 no. That, first of all, that's highly offensive. Um, two, it's not necessarily true. And three, um, Learn, learn to befriend people and treat them with kindness and respect. It'll get you pretty far. So Paul, uh, even when he's arrested, he's given this wild freedom. They trust him. Uh, why do they trust him? Now keep in mind, did Paul have a reputation throughout the Roman Empire? Oh yeah. Every city Paul went to, literally every city Paul went to, there were riots. Every city Paul went to, riots ensued. Roman officials were drug into, drug into this. People would go to the Roman courts and they'd be like, hey, look, this guy's causing trouble. Uh, he's telling people that there, you know, there's another king. Uh, that's a pretty big offense. So Paul is like a thorn in the side of the Roman government, yet they trust him. They like him. They respect him. And I think that's really important. Um, he had the position of authority uh, in the Roman government. What's that? Did he have a position of authority within the Roman government? What happened to the Christians? Um, yeah, yeah, first he did. Before, yeah, before he was a Christian. Yeah, he Paul. Christian absolutely. Christian. Yeah. But it was in conjunction, conjunction with the Roman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Jewish people, like, this is, this is an interesting historical thing. So the Jewish people had a very, um, a very complex relationship with, with the Roman government. Um, the Romans gave the, the Jews actually wild freedom. Um, so throughout the Roman Empire, oftentimes... Uh, people were, were forced, at a bare minimum they were expected, but a lot of times they were coerced or they were forced into uh, worshiping Roman gods. Um, the, the Jews, however, were given exemptions for this because uh, a lot of them worked for the Roman government or worked with the Roman government. Uh, so there was a lot of um, kind of t turning the other cheek um, and just kind of letting things slide. Uh, I don't know if it was actually written into policy, but, uh, but we know that the, the Jewish people were treated uh, pretty kindly by the Roman government. And that's why you see things like when Jesus was arrested, uh, who gets involved immediately? The Roman government. Uh, who contacted the Roman government? It was the Jewish people. They collaborated. They worked together. Um, 
to arrest Jesus and ultimately to have him crucified. And it was a Roman crucifixion um, for Jesus, and it, it was the Jews who uh, brought the charges against him. Um, back to... Um, friends with them. Yeah. Friendly with them. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if that's because they're like, well, this guy, what, is he a murderer? Or is he like he's not doing anything? And then they yeah. what it is, or if he's, he's able to convince them, or, or what? But well, and even, I, I mean, if, if you go back to Paul's arrest, um, if you remember, uh, he's standing before, before the king and he says, um, Paul, I don't, I don't see anything wrong that you did. Had you not appealed to Caesar, I would have let you go. But because you, you made that appeal uh, to Caesar, you will go. You know, he had to by law. When you appeal to Caesar, uh, nobody can undo that but Caesar himself. So, you know, he had, and, and I think he felt really bad about that um, because he was like, you didn't do anything wrong. Uh, there's nothing worthy of, of an arrest. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's a good point. Paul... Paul treats people with kindness and respect, even, even if they're unjust people. Um, Paul still uses that as, as an opportunity to befriend them and to teach them about Christ. He's marked on a mission, and Paul is full of conviction. Uh, verse 5 of chapter 27, And when we, had, uh, set, when we had sailed across the open sea, by the way, uh, another we passage, you talked about that last week, uh, Luke is with Paul on the ship. When we had set sail across the open sea along the coast of uh, Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra and uh, Lycia. There the centurion found a ship of the Al Alexandria sailing for Italy and put us on board. We sailed slowly for a number of days and arrived with difficulty at um, Cnidus. Believe it or not, that sea is pronounced like a K. I had to look at the original Greek because I wanted to say snittus, but it's knittus. Um, and as the wind did not allow us to go farther, we sailed under the lee of Crete off Salmon. Uh, coasting along it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens, near which was the city of uh, Lassia. Since much time had passed, and the voyage was now dangerous because the, even, even the uh, fast was already over, Paul advised them, saying, Sirs, I perceive the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. And because the, the, the harbor was not suitable to spend the winter in, the majority decided to put out to sea from there, on the chance that somehow they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete, facing both southwest and northwest, and spend the winter there. Uh, and then the storm comes up. I'm not going to read this whole passage. We're going to skip a bunch of it. Very violent storm. Uh, verse 19, on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither the sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest lay, lay on us, all hope for our being saved was at last abandoned. This is Luke writing first person saying, we had no hope of survival. That's day three. Uh, that's interesting because Paul, as we learn later, Paul took a different approach, didn't he? Paul knew, and I think it goes back to what you said, Brent. Paul had this vision of going to Rome. He knew he didn't know how, but he knew he was going to make it to Rome. Yeah. Him, so. yeah. Yeah. He, he, he wasn't scared on the trip, I don't think. Which is crazy to me. Because <laughs> this is, like, they're literally throwing ropes around the boat to, to hold it together. Um, this is expensive car cargo. The owner of the ship is on board. Uh, so for the owner uh, to see cargo being thrown overboard, that's not a good thing. Uh, you know it's desperate when the owner gives permission to throw cargo overboard in, in a last-ditch effort to lighten up the ship and to hopefully save lives. Um, so this goes on for 14 days. Can you imagine? You guys ever 
been in a, a, a wild storm, not even on the op open ocean, um, just in your house, when the wind, like our house gets ungodly wind. Um, we've had microbursts. We had a microburst several years ago that uh, blew our bedroom window out, uh, or in. It launched it into the bed. It busted out the frame. Uh, it took off both my chimney caps. Uh, and I figure it was probably 80, 80 to 100 mile an hour microburst uh, that hit the house. Um, I mean, just sheared. I couldn't believe the damage. Um, it was scary. Uh, then the wind eventually, you know, kind of died down. But it was about like 30 minutes of just us being terrified in a solid house with a basement that we can go down to. So even if it took everything off the first two levels of the house, we still would have been safe in the basement. Uh, we were terrified. Imagine that kind of wind being on the open sea with massive waves and darkness you can't see, uh, and the, the, the wooden boat is just getting beat and beat and beat for 14 days of that. Can you imagine? I mean, just try, try to think about what that would be like. The exhaustion. They hadn't eaten. Paul told them, I love this, verse 24, and he said, Do not be afraid. Uh, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. So there you go, back to what Brent said. Uh, Paul knew. And behold, God has granted you all those who stay with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. But we must run aground on some island. Uh, back in verse 22, well, I, I like 21. Not to, not to be a kind of a, a but, but, man, you should have listened to me. <laughs> Paul gets that little jab in. I, I told you. <laughs> I love that. Um, and I don't think he was being cocky about it. Uh, I think he just was being very blunt. Like, I have confidence in my Lord. Like, ultimately, I think that's what Paul's saying. God tells me these things, and I believe him. Because... You can see the conversation there. You can see... <laughs> The, 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 the captain of the boat saying, oh, we can make it, let's go. And, yeah. And he's talking to the centurion, and Paul's like, don't do it. Yep. The centurion's like, what do you know about sailing? Paul, mm -hmm. I'm going to listen to the guy who does it for a living. Right, exactly right. Like, yeah. And then Paul's like, uh, do you believe me now? <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's pretty cool because this, this definitely gives credibility to Paul. Uh, well, I mean, ultimately, it gives credibility to God, right? Because Paul... Paul's been entrusted with this gospel, and he's been telling people, like, I know my Lord. And again, I keep going back to what Penn said, where Penn does not have respect for Christians who don't proselytize. At the end of the day, do we Christians have this kind of conviction that we know God this well, that we trust whatever God tells us in our life? Do we, do we have that level of conviction? Probably most Christians, honestly, don't. And so Paul, even in the middle of disaster, Paul has tremendous credibility. If anything, his credibility increased uh, because of this storm. Uh, then uh, you kind of know the rest. Uh, Paul's urging them to eat. He's like, come on, guys, it's been 14 days. Um, Verse 31, as day went, uh, went about to dawn, Paul urged them all to take some food, saying, Today is the 14th day that you've continued in suspense and without food, having taken nothing. Therefore, I urge you, take some food, for it will give you strength. Not a hair is to perish from the head of any of you. Do you think at this point they, they trusted Paul's word? Well, look at what they said right before that. Like, at this point, they're listening to it because it's like, hey, if they get off the boat, we're in trouble. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. It, it's, it's awesome. Like, they're, at this point, they're officially taking orders from Paul. <laughs> like, hey, Paul, tell us what to do. I love it. I think this is fantastic. Uh, then they, they end up um, shipwrecking. Uh, the ship is destroyed. They all swim. As Paul said, not a single soul dies. 
Uh, do you think that helped his credibility? I think tremendously. Uh, then they're on, uh, on Malta. They figure out that this island is Malta. And the people are extremely nice. And what's Paul doing on the island? Besides for getting bit by, by a viper, um, what's Paul doing? Yeah, he's preaching. Uh, and some of the people come to Christ. Everywhere Paul goes, Paul is marked on a mission with complete conviction. There is no wishy-washy like, well, let me be careful not to offend people, or let me tread lightly here. Uh, you know, they're calling me Zeus. You know, uh, I, I better be careful. Like Paul, Paul preached unapologetically everywhere he went. Paul wasn't afraid of offending people. Uh, and then when Paul gets to Rome, I, I, I want to end with this. Um, See, verse 30, by the way, people are coming and going. Uh, Paul has a guard who's watching over him, and Paul's given tremendous freedom while he's in Rome. I think that's really cool. Uh, Paul's able to come and go uh, as he pleases. Paul's living at his own expense. Uh, chapter 28, verse 30, he lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness, and without hindrance. Uh, so for two years, Paul preached. Paul taught the gospel of Christ. Guarantee there were many people who came to Christ. Uh, a lot of people became Christians. And what's interesting to me is Luke ends it there, and we don't really know what happened to Paul. Um, there's a lot of speculation uh, there's early church history that says Paul eventually was, was uh, pardoned. Uh, Paul went, he, you know, he moved around a little bit, and then eventually uh, Paul was arrested and beheaded. Uh, that's church tradition. We don't know for sure that that's what happened, but we can speculate uh, that Paul was martyred because uh, Paul wasn't a really old man, so it's not like he just kind of lived gracefully. Like, if Paul was still preaching, we would hear about it. Um, but Paul just, I mean, literally the story just ends and, and Paul falls off the pages of the Bible. Um, I think what's interesting about that is as Christians, as American Christians, we, we feel so ripped off when Christians die, when people get sick, uh, when people... Um, get into car accidents and die. My brother Mike died, uh, dropped dead of a massive heart attack at the age of 42. You know, we, we as American Christians feel like, well, wait, they dedicated their life to God, and this is how it ends? Uh, but God's not really concerned with the physical ending. God's concerned with our spiritual uh, Longitude, I guess you could say, longevity. Uh, and, and it goes back to what Paul said. Why are you guys weeping and breaking my heart? I, I'm not only ready to be arrested, I'm, I'm willing to die for Christ. I don't care. That's not the end of my life. I'm going to preach wherever I go because I'm marked out with a mission. I have full conviction. When people come to Christ, they're coming with me. Um, so I, I think we really need to sit with these scriptures and think about our own level of conviction. Um, I know that mine is probably pretty darn soft uh, compared to Paul's level of conviction. All right, we're out of time.